spirit agenda. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, we done that. Then I got to read. Uh, uh, any apology, Matt? Chair, we've got Councillor Tony Rogers, and so far, Sherelle Jago hasn't appeared, so I'll give apologies for Sherelle as well. Thank you. Okay, members reminded that the personal responsibility to declare personal and previous interest in respect of matters contained in the agenda in the coordinated supervision of the local government for an Act 1992. Related to the Council of Tax and Local Government Act 2000, the Council of Constitution and Members Code of Contact. Members remain members remain in the most indebted members subject matters that interest relates to the city and the nature of personal interest. Oh, and where members withdraw from it then a contest of disclosure of previous interest must notify the chair when leaving. Okay, that's been done. We go back on number agenda three other services. And I believe and Thank you, Councillor Smith. You would have received the report um, in time to have a look at it. I'll just go through some of the key points in there. It provides scrutiny with an update on the current position of adult services and the future plan for us dealing with how we move forward in terms of adult services. Section 3.2 indicates what we currently provide. We have a mixture of directly delivered services and commission services. And you can see in section 3.2 where those day services are actually cited within the county borough. We, we commission services outside of our directly delivered. They tend to be more specialist services. And the example we've put in here is the National Autistic Society, um, which provides a very specialist service for people with autism. There are two primary reasons for people accessing day services. One is that people, um, it provides respite for carers, but whilst people, people are attending day service, um, it becomes a meaningful day and it supports their independence and their well-being. Prior to the pandemic, we supported so 123 people through the provision of these day services. Obviously, over the period that has changed, and you can see in 3.8, we are currently supporting 72 people and in day services because we've had to reduce the capacity within there because of the social isolation. Where we were, section four, you know, prior to the pandemic, we operated five days a week supporting 123 people. Whilst the services operate over five days, we had a mixture of people attending. Some were coming for one day, some people come for five days. But on average, most people attend for two to three days a week based on their individual needs. And in addition to this, they will also access out, out, outside um, opportunities as well. In order for us to reopen services, we had to look at a priority exercise and that was undertaken with care managers, the individuals and the service to look at who was, was sort of at most at risk with the reduction of day service. And then we prioritised those people coming back and gradually we have increased the number of people as we can become more confident in the way we can manage um, the social distancing arrangements. OK, some people chose not to come back and they remain the court of individuals who still are not confident with coming back into day services because the risks of COVID, as you're aware, are still within the community. And at the moment, there's still a very high number. So some people have chosen to refrain from coming back as well. So even those that we identified at risk. We started work, uh, in, as you can see in section 4.8, we had started a review of day services and how we were going to redesign it. And we'd commenced some work up with um, Gihardi Health Park um, in terms of adopting the meaningful care matters. So we'll go on to section five. We continue to operate day services at reduced capacity um, in line with social distancing. We've looked at, for those people who can't attend for whatever reason, we've looked at alternatives such as direct payments or increased sitting services through our domiciliary care contracts to support those people where required. 
we can't sort of we anticipate those changes because initially we did this back in June, July last year. We anticipated we would only need to make those adjustments for a short period of time. But we're now nearly 18 months later and these areas need to continue. So <clears throat> one of the things that we've been looking at now is what can we do differently? So that going forward, that we look at an option of, you know, sort of this has gone on for a long period of time, what's the impact on the people and where do we need to move to going forward? We started building work up in Unit 2 in um, Tikahadi, which was Health Park, not Tikahadi. Sorry, I was going back to olden days then. Um, and the day service there has been reopened and renamed Tienvis. And I think quite a few of our members have been up there to have a look at it. And it's really fantastic new day service. Um, and from that, it really highlighted that our learned disability day service is nowhere near as um, sort of good an environment as the new uh, dementia area. So we'll be working on that going forward. Right, where do we want to be? We want to realign day service offer to deliver a mixture of building based and community based provision in a more person centred way to meet the goals and the aspirations of the people who spend the day with us. And then in section seven, where do we need, what do we need to do next? We need to review the care and support plans of all the individuals who receive day services. They're in the process of sourcing an individual to und undertake this role for us. We need to continue with the feasibility work in respect of the improvement of the environment of the Learning Disability Day Service at Kihardi Health Park. And we've submitted a fees, um, bid against the Integrated Care Fund capital element, and that's been approved. So we've got £100,000 now to do the feasibility in preparation for the further work. But our health colleagues are taking the lead on that because it's their building. We will continue to work with People First as part of the Regional Commissioning Group to explore opportunities for work experiences as an alternative to building based day services for people who, uh, with learning disabilities. And we will need to revisit the draft day service strategy because our initial thoughts now need to be revisited due to COVID. So if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer where I can. Thanks. OK. okay. All right, Cheryl. Go ahead. Apologies for my lateness. No, no problem. Martha who sent it that uh, you could be late. Oh, thanks. No problem. And just very good news about the extra grant. We had to support that up there. So, Deck, your hands up. You're on deck, you're on mute. My apologies, that button wasn't working. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Hi, Angela. Um, just uh, just for clarification, at 5.6, the day services were supporting 72 individuals. Is that what the numbers are now, 72? That's the current number of people who are accessing day services. And there's a mixture of some people have chosen not to revisit day services at the moment. Whilst others then, we've reduced the number of days, so where they may have been attending five days, uh, we may be looking at them attending now for three or four days. So it's trying to equal out the opportunities to everyone. Uh, thanks, Angela. Just one more thing then. Um, has everyone that wanted to attend the services been able to attend, uh, been allowed to attend? Um, and if they, if, oh, I'll let you answer that first, sorry. I think most of the people who've asked to come back, you know, we prioritised it. Those that were at, you know, sort of risk where there was care and breakdown, we appreciated, you know, the level of need of those individuals and support required. I think, I don't think we've got anyone who hasn't returned who has asked to. I think the situation has been, though, that we have had some people requesting five days and we've not accommodated five days and only um, been able to offer three or four. Where people have asked for it to be accommodated for, you know, five days, obviously you haven't been able to do that. 
Um, have they at least been able to go weekly, or would it be over like longer, longer, longer term, like t over two weeks or stuff? It's all everyone's returned has been returned on a weekly basis. We have made some adjustments for individuals for specific weeks. You know, where carers have been ill, um, we've increased um, their attendance to support those carers for a short period of time. Um, some of the people who are not attending, we've then looked at direct payments. So people are receiving direct payments for community support in in not in full replacement of day services, but as part of that support. And that's the bit we're looking at at the moment is where individuals are choosing and receiving direct payments and have been for the last 18 months. Is that a better offer for them? So we're going to review it with the mind's eye of this being a more permanent adjustment for some of those individuals. And, and then lastly, um, you know, when you engage with the indiv individuals, uh, whether or not they, these are the ones that are, are coming, maybe even on, on on the reduced service, and then the ones that are having the direct payments, are they more like, at the majority or are they all happy with with how things are going? Obviously, it's been difficult for, for everyone over, over the last 18 months. I think probably some of the, the biggest, in, we've had a small cohort who have been quite vociferous and saying that they want the, the person they support to return full time. Uh, we have explained that we're not able to do that. The other thing we had to consider as well is how people come in today services, because previously they would have gone round in, uh, a bus would have gone round and collected everyone and brought them into day services. But then that caused a real issue in as much as you couldn't have as many people on the bus um, to access day services. So a large number of families now bring people into day services to maintain that social distancing to and from the day service. Um, more so, I think, you know, sort of our understanding, as I said, the quite a few people are still not confident in sort of people going into group activities because of the rate of um, transmission of COVID within the community. Angela, obviously the services uh, are not just for the people that are re receiving the services, they're probably to give families a break as well. So is there, is there support out there for those families um, where, where, the, where their family member hasn't been receiving um, all those extra, those extra hours? There's a level of support, as I said, we increased some day sitting services um, as part of the offer. Some of it was through direct payments that would take people into the community rather than go to day service. But obviously we haven't been able to replicate the full level of day services. So if someone attended for five days and we're only able to attend for three, we haven't been able to fill those other two days with direct payment, personal assistance, or with um, domiciliary care sitting services because of the capacity across all social care at the moment. Sorry, what I was trying to get at was those fa the families that are um, where that person goes for support, say to Kihadi, um, to access services, and it takes a lot of pressure off the family. Um, are any checks made on the family to see how they're coping, that sort of thing? They've been contacting the family. Not all the people who access day services are able to communicate with us. So weekly calls have been made to the family, especially those who are not attending day services with, by the day service staff then. If they identify that there's any risks or the families are expressing any concerns, that's then relayed to the social work teams to go out and visit and see if they need to revise the care and support plan. Ah, oh, lovely. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Any comments, members? Anything? Uh, sorry, Chair. Who's on? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask: Are you are you seeing? I'm sorry, you might have you might have already gone through this. So apologies, Angela. But are you seeing um, any capacity issues within the service to meet the demands of more home visiting? 
Certainly, as it stands at the moment, you know, the social care sectors had significant been significantly impacted by the pandemic. We are seeing there are dormitory care um, commission services are really struggling in terms of maintaining some of the staff. The feedback we get from the dormitory care workforce is that, you know, it's been a really difficult year. Um, some people are choosing to leave social care because of the pressures. Um, whilst there's a commitment through Social Care Wales, and we currently this week have the We Care campaign to again to try and attract people into social care. I think so, I've been translating to very limited number of people who are then taking it as an op um, opportunity. Personal assistance tend to be sort of um, these occasions more for specific individuals where they have a difficulty in recruiting some personal assistance mm -hmm. through People Plus. Um, but overall, I think capacity within social care at the moment is really stretched. And that's across um, day services, across uh, dorms for care and across the care room sector. And in terms of these pressures, because obviously they are prevalent across across, like you said, the whole social care workforce at the moment. Um, but what I'm hearing from some families is that the level of um of visits are being greatly reduced, predominantly around no capacity of staff or staff sickness. So the families are not getting the the service that they were you know, we're requesting and was was highlighted as need as part of their care and support plan. So are we monitoring that in terms of um, being aware of how many, um, you know, uh, non attendance or or no visits we, we're not doing and um, to make sure that we can still look at that demand across the board? The way the domiciliary care operators um, look at it, they rag rate all the individuals that are currently being supported. Okay. So your priority one would be someone who lives independent, you know, lives by themselves, there's no outside support and needs significant support um, in their home. So those would be the people who would be rated red. Those then are amber and then green is, you know, and they look at things like, are they living with family members? You know, can they provide that level of support? Or, for instance, an example would be, in some instances, they go in and provide assistance with preparing the meal. But then if a family member could prepare that meal, they would prioritise the, the the staff to those people who were rated as red and didn't have yeah. anyone else to provide support. But where that has happened, they contact um, ourselves to say that they're doing it. Um, they also then contact the individuals to say that they won't be calling, so it's not just a case of them not turning up. Yeah. I think one provider in particular has been you know, sort of particularly hard hit with a number of staff self-isolating, and it's all short-term arrangements. And, you know, um, in the last couple of months, obviously people uh, have more contact. So the incidents of people having to self-isolate because of being a contact or catching COVID are actually more now than they were in the, you know, sort of first and second phase. Um, yeah. and at the moment, we've seen a lot of staff absences in those areas through contact. Yeah. And it is, you know, and it's a, it's a really sad situation, isn't it? Because, um, like you said, the families I've spoken to must be in your, your amber green situation. And they feel the feedback that I'm getting is they feel really guilty because the service provider is contacting them to say, well, can you get another family member in to do this or to do that? And they're like, we haven't got anyone. And the only one I've got is 80 years old. And, you know, how can I put that on other people? And yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a really quite desperate situation that I wanted to feedback from it's just some. Um, but it is definitely happening where the support is not there out in the community at the moment. In general, these tend to be short term reduction. So it's not that um, they start them for long term. So we haven't got to that sort of um, position yet. But where they, you know, it could be on one week, they might have 20 people who are off. 
Yeah. And it's in those circumstances, as soon as they, those 10 days elapse where they've all you know, sort of um, ended the self-isolation period, then situation improves. Yeah. And the other part is some staff only work in small areas. So it could be that there's, you know, sort of when you start looking at um, some areas, it could be a, a small defined geographical area. Um, because of not everyone drives, so they can't always redeploy staff from other areas to meet that short for. Yeah. But I will get, you know, sort of, they are under extreme pressures, the, you know, the care providers. And they, this is not something, in my knowledge of, and our care providers we've been working with for you know, many years, this is not something they do lightly. Yeah. You know, no, that's really yeah. useful and, and you've really helped me actually understand that process because I've got one family and they said, well, we have X as our our carer now, but he's still in work, but yet I'm having somebody different, but it could be that the priority is different. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. No, that's that's great. Thank you, Angela. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thanks, okay. There you go. Gareth. You're on mute, I think he was up before me, and I think mine may be oh, last sorry, already. Yeah, I apologise. No problem. You're calling me, Bill, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I've got two very brief questions for Angela. Um, Angela, section four, item 4-4, four, four, where access to day services is reduced, alternatives are sought, including increasing direct payments. Um, yeah. Just, just tell me in what way does increase in direct payments make up for the lack of the actual service? We people initially would have said the day services performs two functions. One is to provide some respite to carers, and second is to make a meaningful day for that individual. So what the direct payments do is give people the opportunity to go out. OK, initially there was limited where they could go. So some people are having direct payments where they take the person who would have gone to day service out into the community to do something else, you know, such as going for a walk, as things are open, they're going to cafes, going to cinemas, etc. Whilst others who aren't able to go out into the community as much, that they can have a sitter in the house to support them and do some activities with them. I think some of them have played games, looking at, you know, sort of doing things like activity packs that they've sent out from day services. So they've tried to do things with people in their own home or in their community. Right, thank you very much. Um, the other one, very briefly, um, item 4.6. You refer to a meaningful care matters model of care. Could you just give us a couple of comments um, just to outline what that is? Right, I think people are more um, aware of dementia care matters. Uh, is an organisation that are spe specialists in dementia care. They changed the names about two years ago from Dementia Care Matters to Meaningful, Meaningful Care Matters. Now, some of the things they advocate is that um, people tend to know about is the butterfly approach, where it is every time they are with someone, they make that interaction as meaningful as they possibly can. So rather than just say something like, do you want a piece of toast? They'd say, you know, do not interaction with the person. They say, oh, I remember when I used to have toast and I was just put your jam in it and used to have my toast to, and start that conversation. So that's one of the things. The other element they've got is around bringing people with dementia together in set groups because dementia varies, you know, sort of significantly. So you can have some person who is able to go around the day-to-day -day business, you know, and live a relatively um, independent life. And but we've got others then who were so far um, along the progression of the dementia that, you know, they're unable to know what the name is, they're unable to meet their individual, you know, self-care needs. So they group people into what they call houses or communities. So in the health park, what they do is bring cohorts of people with dementia together into different areas with similar needs so that they can ensure that they're having a similar approach to how the dementia is, how they're supported. 
Does that make sense? That is yes. a very brief, um, it's far more complicated than that. It's about the way the staff interact with people. It goes from having the staff and the people who are living or attending there and everyone works in the same way. So staff will sit and have their lunch with, you know, the people who are in dementia care homes or they will sit and have the cup of tea. So they are part of the community. The staff are part of the community as much as the people who are living there or accessing day service. But if you haven't been up there, I'm sure well, we can arrange for you to go up and see it. It's absolutely fantastic, the new, um, the new day service. And I think there's been some photos put up and it is, you know, really um, impressive what they've done up there. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much, Angela. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Angela. Um, my question is around paragraph uh, five, six. And the quite drastic change, obviously, you explained some of it away um, in your answer with Declan, uh, which is appreciated. But what, how do you explain the reduction from 140 to the 123? I wasn't getting confused with that. Right, probably the easiest way to describe it is. Um... 140 people, if you've been up to, especially up in the learning disability, um, the number of people who access it, the, the environment is very close. So if you went there pre-pandemic, you would see people sitting right next to each other. We've also got a court of individuals who get up and wander around. So when you were looking at sort of spreading COVID, they were approaching everyone. So we had to consider then if those people are moving around, that staff would need to sort of accompany them. So the areas we had to consider was pre-checks for people going in there, you know, such as taking the temperature, pre-warning people if they've got any symptoms not to come out. But these are things now the probably bread and butter to everyone these days. But then we had to look at the environment and how could we keep people two metres apart in line with the social um, distancing requirements. So they did a risk assessment. How many people could we support in there? So that's why there was a significant reduction in the number of people we could support go into day services. And again, some people are choosing that they don't want to come back because of mixing with other people. And there's a large cohort who's still not comfortable with coming back in. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I may have confused you perhaps slightly in my question. What I was referring to is the 142 reduction to 123. Right. Pre-pandemic, you say, was 123. There's also reference to 142 in paragraph 5, 6. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor Richard, I'm just looking there. Oh, right. I can read it again now. Sorry, I can understand that. No, we said that we were doing some work for um, Kihadi Health Park for the de Dementia Day Services. As part of that, we had to relocate from Kihadi Health Park elsewhere. So in order to accommodate that, because we didn't have the same level of um, space in the alternative, because we used the guest keen for a couple of times, um, we had to reduce the numbers temporarily whilst we were uh, accommodated elsewhere. But that was a mixture of um, social services, day service individuals and health individuals. Sorry, I hope that makes sense now. Yeah, right. yeah, Thanks. It, it, it does. Thanks, thanks, Sandra. And my other, only other question is in relation to uh, five nine, where you refer to a draft day service strategy, we may have already seen it, but um, can you refresh us if we have or not, or if we will be seeing it, or is it, if it's available to have a look at? We got to the point where we had a draft that we hadn't actually brought, and we bring all the the um, um, strategies aligned for adult services, and that will be accommodation, day services, and community. Um, as I say, some of the things we had made assumptions was to review, look at moving people, 
linking in with the work that people first have been doing with people who learn disabilities, what's important to them and what are the priorities they want to um, see implemented. So we've done the draft, then COVID hit and now our position is slightly different. So we have to review it. Some of the principles are exactly the same as in moving from the place space to community wherever possible looking at more bespoke um, services, looking at the option of um, using direct payments where people can be, join their direct payments together and do different activities that are of more interest to them in the community. So <clears throat> that's the piece of work we need to go and revisit now because we can't say that everyone, as of today, we cannot say that COVID is over and everyone come back into day services at the same level before. So we have to take into account where we're going to go, but also reduced capacity within our buildings. And what does that mean for individuals? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Bill, with your permission, just final one. You carry on. It's in relation to direct payments, Andrea, it is. Obviously, is any assistance given then to the service user to put them in touch with who would be the provider and a direct service um, payment plan? a company called and then people plus we got too many people first people two people plus people plus um and that organization then supports people in recruiting um in personal assistance it offers support with dealing with payroll what the responsibilities are for people who are accepting you know using direct payments to purchase their care yeah. and you know, they provide all that support and in some yeah. cases where people find it more difficult to manage their direct payments, they will also provide managed accounts for individuals where they take over that responsibility on yeah. their behalf and the local authority pay people plus them to do that for yeah. us. Thanks, Angela. Okay, guys. Yeah, thank you. Angela, thank you very much. The only one I guess is a day service centre in the Earth Park. If members want to come up, can we make arrangements for them to have a look at it? Because I've been up and it's worth having a look. Because I remember the old type day centre to the new one. Yeah. And with, and with this extra grant and everything that's coming through to do the building next door, I was thinking it'd be a tremendous place. Yeah, I think it will be, you know, um, a really excellent um, sort of day service. The one, you know, they're doing a lot more work in terms of the health park now and they're doing the Meaningful Care, meaningful care Matters model, working with health and social care staff to implement that. Um, if anyone's interested, if they want to drop me a line and then I can arrange for um, that visit. We tend to be more at the end of the day when service users have left purely because of the risks of um, lots of people in their day services. Another part I was going to ask in the next report, can we have some numbers of my staff where well, on the sick are working? Um, how much staff do we, do we need? Because the way it's going, I think if it keeps on going in the next couple of months, we'll be back to square one as we were a couple of months ago. Can we have yeah. some base on that for us to know, take a judgment on it? Are you looking at any particular area? Because bear in mind, we... No, I should have said about... Um, yeah, um, there's not care, care homes, um, yeah, we're look, work staff. Look at the whole lot of me, then, Dave. We've got to look. You just can't pick a point on one. Because everybody's right. involved now with this um, coronavirus and it's, it's knocking everything. It's knocking services. It's knocking the administration. It's knocking carers. So on. It's, it's a package that's being affected and it's overall and we got to... We've got to really understand what's happening to support you, the officers. You know, you might need the extra funding to get the extra staff in, and we've got to talk to extra people on that, don't we? Oh. One, oh, sorry, Lisa's just put her hand there. Okay. Sorry, I was just going to add, um, we've got a recovery grant at the minute, Councillor Smith, so that we can look at for an extra resource in over the next couple of months. So we've got to finalise that and send it into our government tomorrow about how we plan to spend. But we have put some extra capacity into the service with some agency staff and obviously looking at staff wellbeing. What I will say is that obviously the vaccination programme is still being rolled out and people are starting to have their boosters. 
So hopefully that will have a knock on effect to, you know, staff absence. Um, and we are getting to a stage now where most staff are returning back to work because either they've had COVID or they've, you know, had their vaccines. But if, if you want to report, then obviously that's something we can pull together for next scrutiny across children and adult services and we can go through, you know, what staff have been absent and things. Yeah, we're mindful for members to understand it because, you know, we've got commerce for members to start staff will turn up and the reason why I think it'd be better for everybody to understand what is happening because it's frightening what's happening because you know you've got the coronavirus getting stronger. I know people have their second jobs, but there's more youngsters going down with it. So you know we got to really look at it now and how do we affect everything? But they've they've started rolling out the vaccine now for 12 to 15 year olds. Yeah. Also before half term it's likely that most young people will have been offered the vaccine. So, I mean, the increase this time has been young people, uh, you know, testing positive. And that's obviously having a knock on effect, either right? they're passing it on to parents or grandparents. Um, but hopefully, I think the numbers have started to come down now, but it's whether or not we'll see an increase, you know, over the winter period, because we'll have flu as everything else that comes with the winter. So. Yeah, I'm just getting ready to see what the winter brings in because winter, winter pressure is going to be tremendous, are they telling us? So, for us to understand what's happening. Okay, with you. Okay. Any, any more questions? So, Ange. All right, Ange, I do appreciate it. Thank you much for the report. Okay, thanks. All the best. Okay, folks, and then we've got number four is the building blocks, early help, building blocks success, early help on us. Tara, are you there? Afternoon, Councillor Smith. Oh, I will take you this time. Thank you. Hey, thank you for yesterday. No problem. Okay. So the purpose of the report, as members will be aware, was to provide an overview of the Early Help Action Plan. And Early Help sits as one of the six key building blocks to success within the Children's Services Strategy. In February 2021, so this year, Children's Services provided scrutiny with an overview and update of the service strategy for improving the well-being of children and young people. The strategy sets out our approach to delivering our council duties to vulnerable young people, including the early help hub um, or early help building block to success. And um, you'll see within the report that there is information shared within the introduction and background around the legislative context of our early help provision and where that's rooted and how our service strategy links into that. Then we'll see in section four, we give an overview of where we were and we shared in February 2021 um, with scrutiny committee an overview of our progress. Um, that was in respect of the Early Help Hub multi-agency safeguarding hub, information advice, assistance and assessment, our young carers service, team around the family coordination and supporting families transition between preventative and statutory services. We will also note that in January of this year, families first um, came into the children's services structure, and whilst that's still relatively within his infancy, is very much being um, embedded in terms of the way that we work. We did share at that time in February that our next steps under this building block were to continue to support our community to access the right service at the right time, to support the maximisation of preventative services being utilised, to look for every opportunity to increase the capacity and reach of preventative services, to evaluate, adjust based upon evidence of the needs and effectiveness of our service delivery, was to use the ICF funded health post to commence their presence in the early health pub and it was to look together with early action together to engage um, a police present within the early health pub at that time. In terms of where we are now and um, what we've included some figures in today's report just to give scrutiny members a flavour of the demand and changes um, that we see in, in terms of our early health pub and our multi-agency safeguarding hub at our front door. Um, we'll notice that comparatively we've seen a significant increase in referrals in quarter one and quarter two reporting has just concluded of this year. To give that some context, in the first two quarters of this year, we've seen a 74% increase in the number of early health referrals that are going through the early health hub. 
if that continues at the current rate that we have, we will see more than a doubling or 150 percent increase across the year of the referrals. Um, currently, this is still the same staffing base within the hub, but we've recently secured some funding to help with some of the staffing demands there. Equally, the number of proportionate assessments across the early help area of our service have increased considerably. It's important to point to members that we have seen an increase in the number of families who opened a team around the family, so under Families First, step up into the statutory services. Whilst this has always been a relatively stable number um, for a team around the family and has generally sat between 5 and 7% for a number of years, we have seen an increase. We've put there the actual numbers that that's out of because I think that numbers give us a little bit more confidence in terms of how we would meet that demand. But equally for that, that is something that we intend to monitor. Well, something, as I said, we need to monitor, I think is probably important to consider that we would anticipate that level of demand increasing in an escalation. Um, because as we know, for the last 18 months, services have not been able to um, practice in the most optimum way to prevent escalation with face to face delivery not being what it was pre pandemic. Equally, we'll note that the number of weekly uh, average referrals into our MASH system is now at pre-pandemic levels and the weekly average proportionate assessments being undertaken is just exceeding pre-pandemic levels. Currently, just to report to scrutiny um, that that's being well managed by our intake and assessment team and case laws remain manageable. But once again, that will be something that we really do need to monitor moving forward. In April of this year, we updated all of our strategy building blocks and one of the four key aspirations under our early help building block was for all citizens to have access to clear information on services, early intervention for families to be supported to continue caring for their children at the earliest stage to prevent the need for formal interventions, enhanced working with agencies that supports early identification of families who would benefit from early help and children and young people who have the right emotional support at the right time. This building block really does aim to reach further out into the community outside of statutory services to make sure that we're looking at cases at an earlier juncture and making sure that families have the support that they need. In line with that, we've had the appointment of a, a staff member within the Early Help Hub and part of their remit is to support our DOIS information. Mm -hmm. There's a programme of work ongoing to update and increase user friendliness of children's services information on the local authority website. Mm -hmm. And this will include developing digital stories about the support that Early Help can provide. And we've recently secured through grant, as Lisa referred to earlier, some additional funding that that will help from a statutory angle about us doing some digital stories about statutory processes to assist families further. Our quality assurance framework within children's services continues to undertake monthly audits of decision making to ensure that the demands are not impacting thresholds and the right decision are being made at the right time and we continue to have confidence in our area of the service. Ensuring that families are supported in early stages and multi-agency responsibility. And we shared with you our ambition to have a CAMS liaison worker within the early help hub and a police presence. Unfortunately, due to some recruitment difficulties, a police presence hasn't yet been established. However, there is a CAMS liaison worker who is in post and that has been extremely successful and supportive. Both families and staff have given us considerable positive feedback and you'll note under 5.6 and 5.7, there's some data just to illustrate how that post is working. Of the consultation work undertaken by the CAMS liaison worker, 68% has been of a preventative nature, with 32% being for cases open to children's services on a statutory basis. We would be very keen to keep those numbers as they currently stand because what we want to make sure that we do, as I said earlier, is catch those cases at an earlier juncture. And just to give today's scrutiny, I suppose, a flavour of the feedback that we've had, you'll see that detailed in 5.7. The early help have continued to raise awareness in relation to the service they provide, and we've given some context to the services that we've done awareness raising sessions with during the first two quarters of this year. 
staff within education and children's services are also in the process of completing trauma-informed schools training and that's about making sure that we have a common language at that front door so that we can work well with our education to understand how we can help families earlier and use that common language so we can really pick up on any concerns and explore them in depth. We've also developed an education and children's services partnership programme um, and that is breeding significant success in making sure that we all understand each other's business and that we understand the range of support that all different remits offer. Just to update scrutiny and I'm sure this won't be a surprise that the COVID pandemic continues to influence the changing needs of our community and how we must adjust to meet those needs as a service. Um, and I hope that this report has demonstrated how we have adjusted um, in that regard. What I would say in terms of Section 6 and where we want to be, so moving forward, we want to continue to be a resilient service that adapts to the changing needs of our community, to be well informed by key data and service user feedback, to work with partners to ensure that our community can access the range of services they require, and to continue to support staff across both prevention and statutory services to continue to work towards achieving our four key aspirations, as I've shared earlier, underneath this building block of our strategy. I'm not sure if there's any questions in terms of the report. Carl, thank you much, appreciate it. Any questions from members? Because I think it's an excellent, it's an excellent report. Since this has come into play since February, a lot of work can be done against you yourself. And I think if some simple things was in place, I think it would be chaos. That's, that's my own comments because there's a lot of things supporting the parents, the children, and everybody in, in line. And that's what they need, and that's what we want to improve it. Any Sherelle, sorry. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thanks, Taryn, for the report. Um, we can see that the levels of referral into the early help hub um, are significantly increasing. Um, so, you know, it, it does evidence the need for that service. What I'd be interested to find out is what are the common themes for the referrals and predominantly where are these referrals coming from? Um, what would be useful for us from a scrutiny position would be um, how many are self-referrals, how many are from social services, how many are from preventative services. And I know that's a lot of data analysis, but if we're looking at early help, We've got to look at the preventative agenda and we need to know what the needs are out there in order to inform future practice and into in, to inform future investment into this area of work as well. So I don't know if that's something that you'd be in a position to provide at the next report around early help um, the same way as that you've you've um, displayed lots of the other figures. That's my first question. Uh, so in respect of the data, I suppose it's a very interesting observation because when we looked at last year's data, that was what really stood up to us in line with the metrics that we have to report against. And um, whilst they help, I suppose, understand wider needs, what we've learned is actually that we need more detailed method information. So mm -hmm. we spent quite a lot of time at the start of this year breaking down those referral reasons so that we can track them better looking at what the outcome of each of those referrals are and all the agencies that referred in. So I would be more than happy at the yeah. Next committee to provide that information. That would be really, really good. And then in, in addition to that, I might be pushing it now, but I'll ask anyway. Um, in addition to that, I think from a scrutiny committee, what would be really, really useful for us if is if the, the where the referrals are coming from across the county borough, if that could be highlighted, because I think what that would help us to analyse is whether or not there's just a common spread across the whole of the local authority or whether there's hot spots of, of family needs in prevalent areas. And again, that goes back to thinking forward, thinking about preventative services and the needs within communities so we can better shape services for the future. Um, because the early help hub is all about, you know, that preventative model and, and getting to people before needs are escalating. It's all very well and good doing the work after they come in. But if we know that we have got hotspot areas in the community where there's a high prevalence of family need, 
that's for us then as elected officers to go and shape those services for the future. So I don't know if that's something that you could really help us with in terms of, you know, really pushing forward and moving forward with the with the early help hub, really, um, as a local authority. And I just got a couple more, if that's OK, Chair. Yeah, you carry on. So I, I think the point that you raised once again is a really appropriate point and one that we've been looking into. I suppose in the way in which we record data, we have looked at whether we have a breakdown around flying start and non-flying start areas so we understand if there's a difference in that makeup. Um, but we've interestingly done a piece of work recently and what we've found is there's lots of um, families who would traditionally access flying start because of private rental are then in different areas so that that impacts that information to a degree. We're currently looking about how on the system there can be a report written um, and it would be quite a considerable package of, of, of writing actually for um, the, the WICA service about how we group postcodes but I think, to be fair, that's probably a work in progress and we are probably about 12 months off being able to provide that data because of the sequence writing that's needed behind the system in respect of that. So we can currently search per postcode, but what we need to do is group them. So that gives us, as you've suggested, more hotspot data so that we can actually shape services around communities. Apologies. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, um, Fab, that, that's really useful. But, you know, if that's something that we can have in the future, that would be great. So I'm, I'm glad that you're working on that. Um, quick one on 5.9. Um, you talk about the schools having um, trauma informed approach training um, soon. And I just wanted to um, check that early years practitioners would be incorporated in that, that workforce development training as well or is it just focused for schools at the moment? So it's just being focused for schools at the moment because it's currently in a pilot stage so the four secondary schools and one primary school is taking part in that pilot um, and that was about when we all sat down and kind of worked through cases about us having a very common language that we speak in to make sure that things don't get lost in translation at referral points. Depending upon the success of that pilot and what that gives us, then we would already have an eye to wider roll up, but we just really need to let that pilot um, do what it needs to over the next three, uh, six month period and then evaluate the learning from that because of the package of training that needed to be undertaken. It was a three month commitment. Um, so in total, it has taken um, a, a significant period of time, but we, but we do hope that there will be some structure on which we can move forward and roll out some wider training. Fab. And I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, the early years is incorporated in that model because um, it's, again, that's that's the, where the preventative work needs to be to stop it from escalating. So that's that's positive as well. Um, 5.6, it makes a reference to um, integrated childcare funding. I just wanted to know a little bit more about that, that funding. Um, so I haven't heard of it personally. But I didn't know, is that local, is that Welsh Government funding or? Yes, yeah, so it's um, it Welsh Government funding um, and the way in which they process funding and the names of that are due to change at the end of this year. Um, but underneath that programme, there was going to be a CAMS liaison worker for all three of the local authorities within the region. Um, but Mirtha um, successfully appointed, so we are the only pilot that's run for that. Right. Um, but there's also been by the health board a single point of access developed, so we're currently in discussions really about what that will look like after March of this year. Fab, that's brilliant. Just a couple more questions. Is that okay, Chair? You can, you are. Nobody else will land that, by the way. On the same aspect of, of funding, um, and obviously lots of the reports at the moment are looking at um, pre-COVID pandemic and now the aftermath of COVID, um, there's no reference in here regarding the child development funding that Welsh Government issued last year and again this year, um, and, I, and that funding has been directed to local authorities and allocated per, you know, a, a, a sum for each local authority. And that money is all about um, COVID recovery and reducing waiting lists for access 
to services, etc. So from an early help perspective, I was shocked there's no reference to in uh, in the report to the Child Development Fund. And I was just wondering what Merthyr is spending that allocation of post recovery money on um, locally. So in terms of, of the funds that's been coming forward about post um, pandemic recovery, the reason it isn't included in the report because that's only been finalised with after the report was written. As part of some of that funding, there is an allocation for enhanced parent and support work. Um, there is the um, outreach fly and start initiatives that we're looking to fund. In addition to that, there's additional capacity in the early help hub that I referred to earlier. Um, so there's been a range of services commissioned um, underneath that, that that I would be more than happy if it would be of assistance to just circle it in bullet point form. That would be that would be really useful. Thanks, Taryn, because obviously that's additional public money that's given to us, given to us as a local authority to support the recovery of COVID. And, it, you know, we I think we need to know that information. Um, and then my final one, you could be delighted to know, I think is my final one. Oh, no, I got two more. Um, in terms of the model of the early help hub, um, the report alluded to the fact that the, fam the family's first programme now sits under children's services. Um, I was a little bit concerned about the rationale behind that to split two of the Welsh Government's high profile preventative services, which is Fly and Start and Families First. And now that, you know, what what was the rationale behind that split? Um, and the second part is, how does the Early Help Hub link into the Welsh Government's offer of local authorities becoming a pilot for the early years integrated transformation pilots? So in respect of the approach for families first to come into um, underneath children's services, that was about joining up closer working. So joint there's significant joint commissioning between families first and fly and start, which has really helped those services integrate better and then have a very clear link with statutory services, which has been really supportive, even though that movement is generally within his infancy. So there hasn't been um, any detrimental impact in terms of how they link up. Part of the rationale for that was really about making sure that we map out a family's journey um, in with a golden thread through the way that we make decisions across the service. So there needs to be a marriage around team around the family and the front door of statutory services to help the seamlessness of families moving up and down between those service sectors and to enhance the decision making to make sure that there's a consistent threshold across both. Um, but once again, as I said, there continues to be very clear work in, um, and Lisa uh, uh, chairs our poverty agenda. So all of that very much sits very succinctly under that. And then what about the um, Welsh Government are, are currently encouraging um, local authorities to uh, be pilots for the early years integration and transformation work? Um, I think the work of the Early Help Hub sits significantly within that area. And I just, have, is the local authority taking up that offer to become a pilot and having that additional investment? Or if not, what are the, why is, what's the rationale behind the decline? And what I would say is it would probably be helpful if I take that query away from the meeting and come back just to um, liaise to see exactly what stage we're at at that at the moment, if that's OK. okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Sorry for all the questions. Thank no, you. Great, Thank you it's, it's really important, isn't it, that it's di discussed thoroughly. Yeah. Fab, thank you. Yeah, we don't know what's happening. But uh, on, on that um, last question of, of Sorel, have we got a problem on uh, time and date? So do you fit it all in? No, what I would say is, is um, it's been a number of weeks since I've had an update in respect of that specific area of work, and I just wouldn't want to share any information with scrutiny that wasn't up to date. So I would just feel more comfortable going away and coming back if that is okay. Yeah, could you, could you send a copy to all members then? Because uh, you know, we, I'll say ask the question is, where are we? Oh. Yeah, most definitely. Great. Thank you much. Councillor, you want to I believe? Only um, something Councillor Jago said about prevention. Um, one of the things that the Improvement and Recovery Board were looking at was prevention and how it sort of assists, if you like, the statutory services. 
So it shouldn't really matter where, you know, services sit. It's about us working together. And that's one thing that they've been really keen to push that education and children's services work much closely together. The feeling was that obviously the early health hub and some of the prevention we need to improve within children's services. So that was the feeling why family first moved across. But it is something that's still being discussed about where prevention should sit. But I think it is about how we work very closely together with education rather than us be seen as two different services. So that is a discussion that's going on and is likely to be a report that comes to council in the near future. Lisa, uh, thanks for that, Lisa. Oh, sorry, Chair, I jumped in then. No, you Thanks for that, Lisa. That is, that is useful information. And yeah, I completely agree. You know, the departments need to speak more in terms of social services and education, but I just didn't want the, the transfer over of families first to make it more divisive than it already is rather than it having, so having the opposite effect of what you want it to be really um and it's just making sure that preventative services is a common thread now in children's services as well like i said about the uh, the um uh a trauma informed approach model. I just think whatever you're looking at from uh, one area has got to go all the way down to preventative services and think about the all the work that came out over the last two years around the first 1000 days agenda and how much money we can save as as societies if we get it right right at the, at the beginning of of these families journeys. So no thanks for that. That's really useful. Any more questions, members? Everyone happy? Yeah, I think you've done well there. Thank you very much, appreciate it. But I think it's what Lisa said is right. We've got to work closely with education, social services, and get a stronger link, and not just say, yes, we carry on. I think that um, we got to work, and that's the way forward now. Education and social services, working forward. Okay, Tara, thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, so we go back on number five as the forward work program. If you notice today, we should have the annual report on complaints and on compliments. That's not coming till January because the young ladies on on annual leave. So, so that's why it's not on today. So that's that then. Are we happy with that? So. Number six, this is the one, right, start time and committee meetings. We've been asked by former cabinet member of social services, Chris Davis, who have met with the voluntary action youth um, children, if we can change our starting time for, because they can't attend our meetings because of our school time effort. So you've asked us to Look at, can we go start at a later time? So I'm going to some members now and what he was, what, what they have put forward is, can we start up as three as a pre meeting and four o'clock as a full meeting? I don't, I don't mind that whatsoever. So I'm leaving it to you. Any comments? Well, I was late today and couldn't attend a pre meeting due to work commitment. So the later, the better for me, Chair. Yeah. So you have it. I'll endorse you on that as well, myself. Yeah, I haven't got a problem with that. Yeah. Can we score the ones on this one? I'm not done when came back. Is that all in favour? Yeah. Thank you, man. got his hand there. Oh, I don't know if we were right that. Yeah, no, you can write any hand will do. I'm not proud. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, Matthew, are you there? I am your chair and I will update so, the system so, and the agendas going forward. Uh, yeah, great. So Thank will you. you notify or do you go through Sean and notify them? Um, the <laughs> yes, chair, an email will go to them. Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment, Bill, about the times of the meeting. Uh, and just to say what suits me, really. Um, I don't mind meetings in the middle of the day and I don't mind meetings in the evening. But these sort of twilighty meetings, when I'm functioning normally, um, I take Sarah to work in Neath, and I'm out around the sort of late afternoon, very early evening. But um, whatever time it is, I'll make it anyway. But I just thought I'd throw that in to confuse everybody. Yeah, 
no problem. You managed before pandemic, eh? Hey, I'm confused anyway. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so you're happy with that? Well, they're also going to ask us, this could be reviewed. Because I'm concerned about we can give this and then none of the volunteers, the youth will turn up. So we're just saying that we are going to check them if they do turn on. Because it's unfair for us to change the time for everybody and then they don't bother to turn up. So they've got to show an effort as well, haven't they? Yes, definitely. That's my motto. So we saw that out. Um, Scrutiny for us, I got one. In the last scrutiny, we had uh, they then come in for the uh, youth um, offending team. And I wasn't happy with the report. And I think we had the same amount of report last year. Could be wrong. But I asked them for a training day, what they do and everything else. So I'm asking for members, what's the best time of the day for you to do it? For we can make arrangements. And once we get the time factor, then I'll show and then they send out the daytime for us to give to Lynn when we want them to talk about it. Because I don't know what they're doing, you for the friend and team. I don't know if any of else can advise me. But I used to know, but they, because they joined up with the RCT, we just lost a bit of it, don't we? So I remember feel. Same sort of response from me, Bill, really. Yeah. Um, the later, the better, due to other work commitments. So about yeah. four o'clock? Yes. Yeah. Four o'clock late afternoon, something like that, and then we work at eight, eh? Yeah. I hope, so, hope Sean have you heard that. Yes, Chair, sorry, I was just going to ask. Um, you making tea, weren't you? Are we talking, <laughs> sorry, are we talking um, a week or two weeks, three weeks? I know we said for doing it later in the day is better. Um, well, if you said if a couple of dates out now for them, okay. then we just realise and then we all have the same date and then we can ask Linda and that we'll meet and that date. Okay, so what I'll do, I'll send a quick table around to all the members to see which is the ones that are yeah. available and then I'll send a few dates over and say, can you make these dates? Yeah. Okay. Can we have that? Yeah. yeah. Try to avoid um, October half term, Sean, and chalk Okay. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. When's that? When's that? October? Oh, this won't be done until November. But like, you know, hey, knowing us. <laughs> so, everyone's happy with that? Yeah. All right, refresh for the meeting. Everyone happy with the meeting? Yeah. Yeah? No yeah. comments? Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I, I have no other business deemed by me, so I'd like to say thanks for attending, and I'll see you later. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you all later.